Oh gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again. Just thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to just come together and to study your word. How great is our God. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you not of the spirit but just seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in Christ's name I pray Amen Hi this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com we've been studying together verse by verse through the epistle to the Romans I don't know how long we've been in this epistle but we're now at uh, the 15th verse so we've almost reached the end of the study, although there will probably be eight to ten more videos to complete it. So we're now at chapter 15, verse 1. And just to briefly summarize where we've been, we had 11 chapters of very serious doctrine. Probably the Holy Spirit's outstanding presentation of basic biblical doctrine in all of the scriptures although of course all those truths are, are either uh, pictured or alluded to in other passages of scripture were that the end of the 11th chapter was a strong declaration of the sovereign purpose and plan of God and we began in the 12th chapter to look at some of the results of that biblical doctrine. I spent some time on our presenting your bodies a living sacrifice that God has ordained you, God has ordained the life that you live and the path that you take and how that we are to accept it without murmurings and disputing realizing that it's God who is working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure those are simple statements but as I've taught classes over the years it's been my experience that there are very few Christians who are honestly content with what they have I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content and yet most Christians I talk to are not that I think God wants us to realize that he does have a plan for our lives. I mentioned to a, a Christian the other day, if God wants me sick, I want to be sick. And well, the answer was, I don't want to be sick. No matter what God wants, I don't want to be sick. And that I think is a problem. The prominent attitude among Christians today is they want their way. We are self-centered. We are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And I pointed out it isn't something that we're giving up. It's something that we're accepting from God. The life that he's laid out for us. It's not a sacrifice in the sense of our giving up anything. Our focus is on Christ. And so the prominent attitude among Christians today is they just, you know, they, they can't imagine God allowing them to go through some tragedy in their life. We're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice on that basis. I pointed out it isn't something that we're giving up. It's something that we're accepting from God. The life that he's laid out for us. You may not be as handsome or as rich or as you want to be or as intelligent as you want to be, but your life is in his hands. He knows the way you take, and when he has tested you, you shall come forth as gold. And I believe that is the sense of our presenting our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is, which is our reasonable, logical service. We got into the 14th chapter, which I titled 
the chapter on personal convictions or scruples, that to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The chapter is saying, if you believe it, that it's wrong to play baseball on Sunday, then for you it is sin to play baseball on Sunday. And the chapter went to great lengths to point out that we're not to force others not to play baseball on Sundays. It's, it's not a matter of law, it's a matter of personal conviction. And so we're exhorted in the 14th chapter to recognize that people have various personal convictions and we are to honor those. That is, we're not to put a stumbling block in front of them by saying, well, hey, you know, you ought to do this anyway, whether you think it's wrong or not. You know, you're kind of dumb for thinking that. And, you know, you should go ahead and do it anyway because we're not under law, but we're under grace. We're talking about personal convictions. If, if, it's, if they think it's wrong to them, it's wrong. I believe it is stressed in the chapter that we're not talking about doctrine. We're talking about personal convictions. If you have a personal conviction that Jesus Christ is not God of very God, then, well, then you and I are worlds apart, and you are totally out of the context of chapter 14. You're now in a doctrinal area where we are to stand firm on biblical doctrine. We come then to the 15th chapter. That really kind of on the surface looks as though it's almost a repeat of chapter 14. And I'm not going to spend any time on textual criticism other than to point out that there are those who don't believe that chapters 15 and 16 are part of the epistle. There are those who believe that they were added by somebody else other than Paul. And from the beginning of these studies, I stated my belief that God is the author, the Holy Spirit. The author of Romans is not Paul. The writer of Romans is Paul, but the author is not Paul. Paul's being led along by the Holy Spirit, writing down what God intended for him to write. And, and in my mind, at least, and you don't have to agree with this, there's no possibility that Paul understood everything he wrote. And yet, tons of theological literature wrangles over the question as to what Paul was trying to stress here. You know, what Paul was doing was writing down what the Holy Spirit led him to write. I believe, without doubt, chapters 15 and 16 are a portion of the epistle to the Romans. And so the chapter then begins, We that are strong. What a statement. We that are strong. The assumption seems to be the people who are strong know who they are. And it could be that one who is in fact weak in his area of personal conviction considers himself to be strong. And so we have to take God's definition the strong person is one. We've seen that the strong person is one who esteems every day alike and he's willing to eat anything, recognizing that there is nothing unclean of itself. The weak being the one who esteems something to be unclean and who eats only vegetables. What the Holy Spirit is saying is there are some people who recognize that they are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight, that as the scriptures declare, there is nothing unclean of itself. Uh, we, we, we were not in an area dealing with doctrine. We left that at the end of chapter 11. Chapter 14 was addressing personal convictions the Lord has given us all things richly to be enjoyed, yet there are those who do not accept the fact that all things are clean in themselves. And those are classed as weak, not strong. So we that are strong, the one who eats anything, the one who doesn't esteem one day above another, we that are the strong, and, and it's articulated in the Greek, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
Now, I took a, a good close look at this in the original text. The word we ought happens to be the Greek word for obligation or debt. We have an obligation to bear the infirmities of the weak, and the word bear means to carry as you would carry a load. The word means to tolerate, as though you would put up with something that, that somebody's doing to you. The word means to endure. And as always, we, we need to consider the context. Now, I'm going to suggest that contextually, I think the meaning of the Greek word here is well portrayed in the English, to bear or carry. I don't think that verse is saying that we have to tolerate their infirmities. I think it's saying more than that. It isn't just that we sort of put up with these people, but that we actually care for them. The odd thing to me is how much people will go out of their way to care for somebody who's physically ill. You know, I'm sure you've all heard the story of the otter in Alaska that was caught in an oil spill where the government spent you know, $88,000 saving the life of that otter. You know, they cleaned it up, they brought it back to health, and then they let all the schools out, you know, in the area to come down to the shore because they were going to put the otter back in the ocean. So, you know, they played the Star Spangled Banner and all the kids were out of school and everybody cheered and then wham, you know, a whale came up and ate the otter. You know, we go out of our way even for animals, you people know I'm, I'm a big animal lover. And we'll go out of our way to do anything for those animals that we love, and yet we turn our backs on Christians who have weird personal convictions. In the military, you know, a guy will run through a hail of bullets to save a fellow soldier that he doesn't know, and yet Christians don't do that for other Christians. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The spirit of meekness says that if God tested you like he tested him, you'd do the same thing. I'm not suggesting that the verse is saying that we are bearing with their doctrinal foolishness. We're still in the context of chapter 14. Bear the infirmities of the weak. There's a, a nuance in that word that I think is very important. We ought to bear with errors that people have because of a weak mind. That's what the word says. And again, we've we, we got to be careful. We're not looking at doctrinal errors. There are people without question that have convictions about something they shouldn't do. That's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. I honor that. I may not have that same conviction, but I wouldn't make fun of anybody that had it until it crosses over into doctrine. You know, where you, you know, for example, where you said that you, you know, you know, if you play baseball on Sunday, then you won't go to heaven. Now, we're suddenly no longer dealing with some kind of personal conviction, but with doctrinal truth. And it's astounding how many Christians believe that the things that they do determine whether or not they'll go to heaven. Folks, let me repeat as emphatically as I know how to do it. Your sins are not forgiven because you confess them. They're not forgiven because you repent. They're not forgiven because you're sorry. They're not forgiven because you asked for forgiveness. They're not forgiven for anything you do. They're forgiven because Jesus Christ died in your place. To believe that, you know, we do one thing, anything, to merit God's saving grace and being born again by God from above, by the will of God, is to pit something against the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which I believe is blasphemy. We are not looking at weaknesses that lead into doctrinal error. 
There we have to stand for truth. We're concerned with the unity and the purity and the fellowship of the saints, but we should not subtract from purity in order to emphasize unity. They all go together. Doctrine is important. You've heard me quote this verse time and time again. O Timothy, take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. And doctrine is almost totally ignored in the modern Christian church today. You know, it just doesn't work very well. It doesn't build a large church, and it causes dissension. When Scripture says the divisions must come, that they that are approved may be made manifest. Folks, doctrine is meant to be divisive. That's what its purpose is, to separate God's people from those who are not His. And it needs said that God did not call us, He did not call us, us, to separate sheep from goats or wheat from tares. I mean, I would have called the writer of this epistle a goat if I'd met him before his conversion. But doctrine divides. It's meant to do that. Early in Paul's life, I would have come to the conclusion that he was a son of the devil, but I would have been wrong. And I have stumbled over myself, folks, for three years on this channel to tell you, don't listen to me. I'm I, you know, I'm trying to tell you what I think these verses say. What, what these verses say is truth. What I think they say may or may not be truth. And you have a supreme responsibility to study the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. That's your responsibility. I know personally from the past as well as the present that teaching doctrine causes division just as scripture says it will. I mean, just look at the views that, you know, these doctrinal videos receive as compared to mainstream Christianity. And, and I'm talking about very simple, basic biblical doctrine. Did Christ die in your place as your substitute? And, and if he died in your place, are you redeemed? And if he died in your place, will you die you know, that his death for us was substitutionary. He died for you, not not for you in the sense that, it, you know, if you don't want it, and well, you know, you don't, you don't accept it. And, or, you know, or, listen to me, folks. It, substitutionary is what his death was for you. It wasn't provisional. It wasn't... Well, he died for you. He died for us provisionally. Therefore, you know, if we are willing to accept it, then it, it's his death becomes effective, you know, for us. That is not what Scripture says. His death for us was substitutionary. You had nothing to do with it. You were one of God's elect, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I talk to Christians every day who say Jesus Christ's death was substitutionary, but I can go to hell if I sin. Well, what kind of a substitute is that? He died in your place. He bore your sin and, 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 you, and you still go to hell? I mean, that's a very poor substitute. And I am simply using that as an illustration that doctrine causes division. It always does. He thinks that eating meat is sin, and to him it is sin, but it's not a doctrinal thing until he says that if you eat meat, you're going to go to hell. If you eat meat, God doesn't love you. I mean, those are erroneous conclusions that are not based on the truth of this book. So we're to bear with, we are to help these people who have a mental error due to a weakness and I'm going to suggest that that weakness is doctrinal because it is doctrine that leads to strength. Taking heed to doctrine which will deliver you and those that hear you. Nothing else will, folks. Nothing else will. 
telling them how to conduct their marriage or raise their kids won't deliver them. 95, 98, 99, I don't know, it's got to be way up there. You know, if modern Christianity places an emphasis on what you ought to do. I've never tried to tell you folks what to do. God isn't some genie in a bottle where that if we pray just right, well, he'll, he'll do us all these wonderful things, all these wonderful favors. We are to worship the Lord, to be satisfied with what he's given us. I don't think the weakness in the mind here is insanity. I think the weakness in the mind is doctrinal. Bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. That is, to exalt ourselves, to put us up as a prime example of, of how they ought to live. Now, look at how I'm living, man, so you ought to live the same way. Let every one of us please the one near him, his neighbor, that's the one near him. Those that are the closest to you in your life, those are your neighbors. For his good, my Bible says, but the original text says the good. The word his was added by the translators. For the good toward, that's pros in the Greek, toward edification. The very fact that it says toward edification tells me that we're dealing with one of God's children. And here's the, the clear separation between those who are God's and those who are not. The good toward edification, and I believe the good, I believe that to be doctrinal truth. Shouldn't be surprised. I believe it to be doctrinal truth. Most of the commentaries that I've read on this verse would, would make the good, the good of the neighbor, you know, the things that are for his good. And, and so that's probably why the translators put the word his in there. I believe the word is articulated because God wants us to put our minds on that which is true. I am the way, the truth, and the life, our Lord said. God's word is truth. If we're going to please that man in the truth to his edification, it has to be in the Word of God. It isn't in personal convictions. The easiest thing in the world to do is to preach personal convictions. You hear it all the time. I have convictions on how you ought to deal with your, you know, relationships with your wife and your kids, how to raise your kids, and how you ought to conduct yourself on the job. But it's not my job to tell you how to live, but to tell you what Christ has done for you. Christians are so eager for God to do something for them rather, rather than then just worship him as the God that he is and for what he has already done for them in Christ. If you followed along through this study, through Romans, you have seen just how enormous a, a work God has done in your life. No matter what comes up in 2019, and beyond to 2020 if our Lord does not return no matter what comes up our God is God we are absolutely secure in him earthquakes tsunamis tornadoes wars None of this stuff is going to touch us, folks. And if it does, it will be his will. Why is it so hard to think that if God wants me dead, I want to be dead. If he wants me to be sick, I want to be sick. If he wants me well, I want to be well. Folks, God has laid out my path. He doesn't allow anything to touch my life or yours, except it be for our ultimate good. 
He only deals with us in love. And no matter what happens, He would have us be content. As a closing note, I want, to, I want you all to know just how much I love and appreciate everything that you do throughout the, the life of the short life of this ministry here on YouTube. I've done my level best to try and exalt our Lord Jesus Christ, not self. To deal honestly with the text, leaving the results up to Him. It is God who causes the growth. I have no interest in telling you how I think that you ought to live. My desire has been and always will be to tell you who Christ is and what He's done. To magnify Him because that is what Scripture does. And you all have been, have been and are a tremendous encouragement to me. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. I want y'all to stay close.